Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Gilad Aini, a senior research analyst at CAMERA. And I'm very excited to welcome you all to CAMERA's latest briefing, this latest occasion for all of us to tune in to show that nothing, not even a pandemic, can get in the way of our, of our ambition to learn, to listen, to talk to each other as a community about our community. CAMERA's had a full event schedule since 2020, early 2020, when the coronavirus um, went viral. And of course, we haven't paused either with our vital task of holding the news media to account and defending Israel against libels and attacks. The organization has been as busy as ever, reading every line of news, corresponding with editors on a daily basis, and reminding journalists that facile reporting about Israel won't actually be the easy way out. For me personally, though, it's been at least nine months since I've had the opportunity to read a good book. And I know that because it was nine months ago that my son was born. Naturally, I also reached the conclusion that it would be another roughly 17 years and three months before I'd have the peace of mind to read another book. But then I learned that I'd have the great honor of moderating this briefing. So I immediately ran out, got a copy of Never Alone, Prison Politics and the Jewish People, authored by our esteemed guests today, Natan Sharansky and Gil Troy. And I dropped everything to read it. Almost everything, not the baby, but everything else. And boy, am I glad to have had pushed myself into those pages. The book is beautifully written and yet accessible, even welcoming. It's historical, but couldn't be more timely. And although it's often anecdotal, its wisdom is truly universal. Already in the introduction, for example, the authors point out that in a world with little individuality, real change occurs when each person stops being controlled by fear and starts acting independently. It was a reference to the Soviet Union, of course, or was it? Um, through Natan Sharansky's story, we learn where we are as a people, how we got here, and the dangers, the pitfalls of the path ahead. And since there are dangers, the book can be alarming, but it's also in a way reassuring because it convincingly makes the case that there is a path forward, a case for building bridges during this era of bridge burning, and a case for not only listening to each other with our varied experiences and perspectives, but for passionately disagreeing and arguing with each other. Never Alone, in a nutshell, is a gift to the Jewish people from two brilliant and distinguished authors. About those authors, Gil Troy is a distinguished scholar of North American history at McGill University, an award-winning American presidential historian, and according to Al the Algeminer, one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life which I don't doubt for a second because I've had the pleasure of meeting Gil a few times while helping lead CAMERA's student trips to Israel. Each year we'd bring the students to meet an array of speakers in Jerusalem. And without fail, Gil made one of the biggest impacts. Yes, there were other speakers on the tour with closer ties to the prime minister, with more exotic backgrounds or with larger muscles. But when he started speaking, he cut through the room like a laser. He showed an understanding of the challenges Jewish students faced on campus and helped inform their activism with a deep understanding of history. And where bad faith actors on campus tried to sap their spirit and deflate their energy, Gil filled them up by reminding them of the humanity of their history, of their Zionist heroes, and of themselves. The students always left inspired, and, and so did I actually, even though I heard the, the, the same lecture each time, never failed to inspire me. And speaking of Zionist heroes, our other speaker today needs no introduction. I could leave it with one word, Natan, but maybe that's too casual. So I'll introduce him with his formal title, Mr. Chesh Prodigy, mathematician, Jew, free thinker, refusenik, dissident, dem democracy activist, human rights campaigner, prisoner of Zion, journalist, member of Knesset, honorable minister and chairman Sharansky. It feels like Natan has lived more lives than a cat. He spent nine years in Soviet prisons, alone but never alone, bravely facing down what to others looked like an invincible empire and sacrificing his own freedom for millions of people around him. 
nine more years in the Israeli government, fig figuring out how to tend to his responsibility to his constituents, to the security of Israel, and to Jewish people everywhere. And nine years in charge of the Jewish agency, looking toward the diaspora, watching Israelis and Jews abroad growing together and apart, and working tirelessly to tip the scales toward the former, to, toward the togetherness. One of the striking things about Never Alone is that while these very lives seem literally worlds apart, they neatly overlap, inform each other, and build off each other in profound ways. But I'll leave it to the authors to talk more about all of this. One quick technical note before they take over. Uh, for those watching this, there's an icon at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A with a couple of speech bubbles. If you have a question you'd like to ask, just click on that icon and enter your question into the space that appears. We might not be able to ask every question that's raised, but we'll do our best to capture all the ideas that you raise. And now to our speakers, thank you so much for being here, Natan and Gil. Thank you, uh, Gil, for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, Erev Tov from Jerusalem, where we're both sitting, we're um, neighbors, um, friends, co-authors. Uh, there was one thing you missed in our resumes, Gilad. Uh, we're both big fans of camera. And we're both big fans of an organization that is so delightfully countercultural these days that you, the A in your, um, in your camera name is about accuracy. And to stand for truth, to stand for accuracy in this world that's become so partisan, that's become so polarized, and especially when it comes to Israel, has become so insane is really an amazing gift to um, not just to the Jewish people, but to uh, democracy lovers and truth lovers everywhere. So we're really honored to be a part of this um, conversation and this ongoing conversation. And yeah, I miss you guys. Uh, I always look forward. It was usually around um, June, I think, that you guys would come, June, July. And uh, it was always a great conversation because I was, uh, you know, the, I know there are many uh, on the call who are a little bit post-college, but there's nothing more inspiring than sitting with college students these days, Jewish college students these days, who are standing for accuracy and truth and justice in the Middle East, because we know how hard it is. We know how insidious the attacks are. I wanna be cool. I wanna be accepted. I wanna be for social justice too. And we are, but we're told that we're not. And that's very, very difficult. So uh, the book indeed is called Never Alone. And, uh, the book uses, we, we call it a memoir festo or a manifestoir, where we take Natan's extraordinary life and we use it to advance ideas and ideals that, as you pointed out, despite us living in two very different worlds when we were growing up. Uh, he was born in the vast prison camp called the Soviet Union. I was born in the vast shopping center called North America. Uh, I spent the 1980s studying history at Harvard. He spent the 1980s mostly in the gulag. Uh, he points out that that means that he had moral clarity and at Harvard, I had the moral confusion. But despite our very different experiences, we have very similar ideological perspectives. And it starts with the love of the Jewish people. And that's the essence of our title, that for 75 years, we've been saying never again. And of course we honor our Holocaust martyrs, but we understand that the power, the beauty of being part of this family is wherever you are, you could be in the gulag for nine years. You could be told again and again by the Soviet KGB, secret police, that you're forgotten, you're abandoned. But Natan knew that he was never alone. And that's why we call the book Never Alone. It was originally going to be called 999 for his nine years in gulag, nine years in uh, Israeli politics, nine years in Jewish agency. But I didn't like that title. It's too much of an inside joke. And I worried about my German friends, 999, and my evangelical friends going 666, 999, the devil. Uh, and the notion of never alone is saying we're not just anti-anti-Semitic, we're not just anti-anti-Zionist, but we are for a positive, affirmative vision of Judaism and Zionism and peoplehood. Natan, so many of our students are in crisis these days. So many students on campus feel abandoned, feel beleaguered, feel attacked, even through Zoom. What's the most inspiring piece of wisdom you can offer them. Why should they bother standing up against the crowd when the coolest kids in the room, the professors, the entire infrastructure is telling you Israel's evil, Zionism is wrong, 
give up on those people? Well, uh, I, of course, I am in a very privileged situation because I know what happens when we give up on it. Or, uh, more, more truly, I know what is life without this family, without identity, and without freedom. In fact, uh, I was born and lived through the first 20 years of my life when I had neither identity nor freedom. I had no identity because uh, we knew that we are Jews. It is what is written in the idea of your parents, Jew, but there was nothing Jewish in our life. No, no uh, faith, no tradition, no religion, no uh, Jewish book, no place where you could get Jewish book or read Jewish book, no bar mitzvah, no brit milah, and the only Jewish thing which was, was anti-Semitism. And the message of the parents is very clear that because you're a Jew, because it's happened so that you're born with this word Jew, you have to be the best in your profession. Because only professional success can maybe compensate uh, or be the kind of medicine which will help you to live with this disease which is called to be Jewish. And of course, we also knew that there is no freedom, that uh, uh, you're not supposed uh, to say publicly what you're discussing with the family and whatever you're saying publicly, uh, reading and doing and voting, it's all lies, but the truth can be said only in, in your family. And it is very uncomfortable, this double think life, when you're thinking one thing and saying publicly another thing, but you are not going to fight against this because there are no values except the value of survival of your career. And then when, after 1967, Israel entered our life in such a uh, almost mystical way, all this uh, uh, victory of Israel over the, the Soviet Union, and we were so far from Israel and from uh, its challenges, its problems, and not knew so little. But suddenly, all people around you, all of them, those who like you, those who hate you, they all turn to you and say, how you guys did it. And you understand whether you want or not, but for these people around you, you are connected to Israel. And you want to understand what it means and you start reading in the, uh, in the underground from the books which are brought by, by Jewish tourists. You start reading, in fact, about yourself, about history, and suddenly you realize that if you want, your history is not beginning from Bolshevik Revolution and with all this awful Soviet history. It's uh, starts thousands, thousands of years before from the exodus from Egypt. And it still continues. And it's so easy to feel that uh, this struggle continues. And you look at these guys who are st soldiers near the Kotel, and you understand they, uh, at 1967, and you understand they are 20 years old. And they're exactly as you. And they are involved in such an interesting, inspiring history. And, and you are only thinking about your career. And you discover that the, the, there is that you're part of a big family. These Jews who are coming from Miami, from New York, from London, from different places in the world, they're saying, oh, your father is from Odessa, and my father is from Odessa, or my grandfather is from Odessa. We are family, we want to help. So if you only make switch in your life, my mind, you can have this history, you can have these people, and you can have this state. And this feeling of discovery of identity, that what gives you strength to fight for your freedom, to say publicly, say that you really think, like, oh, I don't really want to live here, I want uh, to live in Israel. The moment you say it publicly, all your life changes, and uh, it is in danger, and you will be searched, and you will lose your job and your, at the end of your career, but you are becoming a free person. And so this feeling that as long as you are part of your family, or the, as long as you are part of this history, uh, uh, you're strong enough to be a free person, that's something what followed me all the life. You know, in the punishing cell, when they, for years they tried to convince me that I'm alone, forgotten, abandoned, uh, uh, my life depends only on me and my readiness to cooperate with KGB. But you know that that's lie, and you simply start trying to think what are all those Jews that I was 
active together with them, being a spokesman of our movement, are doing now. And what are those American tourists who I met and who I mentioned as accomplices are doing now? And what Israel is doing? And what my wife is doing? And you feel that you, you imagine the whole world of Jews working and struggling together. And it happened not imagine it happened to be a real world. And that gives you tremendous strength to fight for your rights, for rights of other Jews and for the better of the world. And that's why whenever I see young Jews who are so confused and they feel, as one told me, for me as a liberal Jew, it will be better if Israel will not exist. Another says, of course, they want to support Israel to sign this letter against the court of Israel. But you know that three of my professors will not like it, and they are very important for my career. That's why I decided to wait and to, not to speak for a couple of years about it. When my career will be guaranteed, I'll start speaking on behalf of Israel. And you're thinking, my God, it's not in the Soviet Union in the times of Brezhnev. It's today in Harvard, in uh, Yale, in the, in the centers of the freedom. And uh, you think, but how much more shallow their life is. That, again, they themselves already, not because of the KGB, but they themselves decide that the most important thing is their career, and let's be quiet, and how much, how uh, all their life is losing the energy, the power of this unique connection, of the, uh, how cool it is to be, uh, to be part of these people. And it doesn't matter how much you disagree with the, the prime minister, with the Israeli government, with one another decision, but, but uh, this the feeling that you are inside this family, together with all your families moving through the history, it's so empowering, it gives you so much energy, it makes your life so interesting. And that's exactly our challenge. How, uh, and the challenge of our, how uh, to make this twist, the jump from the life of trying to adjust yourself to be, uh, to be accepted, to, 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 to change your life, the one which is full of energy, and not simply you dream about Tikkun Olam. You're really dealing with this Tikkun Olam. You're making a world much better place. So even if we as Americans, I see there are Canadians on the call, can't quite understand what it's like to jump from freedom, from slavery to freedom, we certainly can understand the tension between being a careerist and an activist. And we can certainly understand what it's like to feel alone and cut off and feel connected. And I think that's kind of the, the, the trajectory we're trying to invite, challenge, inspire young Jews and old Jews to experience and to see the positive. But you said something quietly and I wanna emphasize it. You, you, you mentioned that we have disagreements. We Jews are expert at disagreeing. Um, we Israelis love democracy so much that we are already on our fourth election in two years and there's fear of a fifth election. When a Jew comes to you, a student comes to you and says, Natan, I get the family feeling, I get the, 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 the sense of belonging, I get that sense of history, but I'm so embarrassed. I, I'm embarrassed by Bibi or by the occupation or by the Palestinians. I'm embarrassed by our unpopularity. I'm embarrassed by our inability to, to unite on anything. How do you help them out of that, that, that rut? How do you give them some sense of inspiration? Uh, well, uh, important thing, uh, the bottom line is, of course, is to, to feel uh, that there are no reasons to be embarrassed. You can be embarrassed for one another leader or for one another decision, but then you simply start fighting against it and uh, you'll be less embarrassed. But there are so many reasons to be very proud that you are part of all these people. And I have to say, uh, people always look, or very often look with nostalgia saying, well, you're lucky guys, you were part of the Soviet Jewry movement. There, there was nothing to argue about. It was clear that there is evil on one hand and good on the other hand, Jewish people against the authoritarian regime. Uh, that's all. Today is much more difficult. Today we have left and right, and, uh, all these religious disagreements and so on. I, had, uh, I think we address it very deeply in this book, uh, more than in any other book that I saw, the question of disagreements inside Soviet Jewry movement. Disagreements between uh, refusing themselves 
культурники, and политики, and those who agree that we all have to go only to Israel, those who think that we have to be for freedom of immigration, and those who are more about interested in human rights, and those who are more interested uh, in the Zionist struggle, and disagreements in American Jewish organizations, which were so high establishment against activists, uh, there were so many organizations, Soon struggle for Soviet Jewry, and conference for Soviet Jewry, and council for Soviet Jewry, and coalition for Soviet Jewry, and 35, and many others. And they, some of them didn't talk to one another, or hated one another, or uh, tried to cancel one another. And sometimes I, as a spokesman, our movement had to put for, you know, foreign tourists under risk when they were smuggling our docu documents twice, because the same document I had to send to two different Jewish organizations which are on the same street in Manhattan, but they will never exchange documents. So it seemed like crazy. Uh, but in the end, you understand that it's because of these many different organizations, you could reach many different groups of people, Jews, practically all the Jewish world. And in the end, what's important, in KGB files, they were all on the same page, anti-Soviet organizations. I think there was a list of more than 200 Jewish tourists in fact, who came to visit us to bring information, to get information. They were from different organizations. KGB didn't care, didn't know to what organization these uh, Jews be belong to this, uh, because after all, it was one struggle of all the Jewish people for the freedom of Soviet Jews, for bringing down the Iron Curtain. And that's how KGB saw it, and in the end, that's how we saw it. So, uh, it was a good lesson for me that you should never try to fight for having one opinion. One, there are people who say, can't you be one organization? You are, there are only a few hundreds of uh, refusals. Why do you need so many different competing organizations? And definitely American Jews. Can't, can't, can't you really unite in one big organization and to speak to, to your government with one voice? So we do. No, it's impossible. Jews will not speak in one voice. Jew will not speak to himself or herself in one voice. Uh, we know that every Jew needs two synagogues. But uh, uh, as long as we remember that in the end we, uh, we are in the same journey together, and we, are, we have a mutual past and mutual future, and we can survive all it together. As long as we remember and have this big picture that all our disagreements are not the reason to be embarrassed. Uh, there is a reason to to uh, try to reach uh, to uh, to come with new and new ideas and to reach more and more uh, people. So we had unity, but not uniformity or unanimity. And um, and this is actually an important lesson I think for today too, which is that we actually need a coalition that's pro-Israel, that's Zionist from left to right. Some are pro-occupation, some. Our, 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 our pro settlement, it doesn't matter when we all yell on Yisrael Chai, when we all coalesce on Yom Atzmut and Yom Azikaron around the power of, of Jewish peoplehood and, uh, and Israel itself. Uh, I see a lot of uh, excellent questions, so I'm gonna turn it over to Gilad in a minute, but just one last metaphor I'd like us to, to leave our um, friends, uh, viewers, and hopefully readers with. Uh, everybody now is an expert in chess because we've all watched The Queen's Gambit. And toward the end of the book, you talk about being in punishment cells. You're in the gulag, the Soviet prison system for nine years. You're in solitary confinement for about four or five of those years, but you're in punishment cells, these sensory deprivation chambers for about 405 days when the Soviet Union wouldn't, had rules limiting people to 15 days at a time, as I understand. And you survive by playing chess in your head. And that becomes a lesson to us about how to work together, even when Israel and diaspora seem to be on different pages, even when left and right seem to be on different pages. How, how to make, connect the dots, how does that work? Okay, good. because you mentioned Queen's Gambit, I have to say it's, it's a very good film, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you know, uh, oh, well, when we were writing our book, Queen's Gambit didn't, uh, was not uh, there yet, so we couldn't use this comparison. But we do write that, in fact, chess was my first escape to freedom. Because in the Soviet Union, when you cannot live by, uh, speak openly your mind, 
And here in the age of five, my mother teaches me to play chess and says, in the chess, you can fly, you can be free. And really, something where, you, where you're the, the only world in which you're not punished for your initiative, to the contrary. And where there are uh, no borders, and you, you can win against everybody if you only will, uh, will try hard. And that's how I was playing, uh, uh, became the champion of the school and the champion of the city and played simultaneously with do uh, dozens of people and then start playing black without looking at the board simultaneously. And I think that in this film, but I can uh, be judge about many things about American life, but the fact how this girl finds through chess freedom of her mind, how to run away from that prison was, was uh, I could feel it very strongly, both as a chess player and the one for, for whom chess was important for the, at the first escape. Now, in punishing cell, I, uh, uh, the, I was supposed to, uh, to become intellectually, to weaker and weaker and weaker, because it's dark, it's cold, three pieces of bread, three cups of water, and not, uh, nobody to talk to, and you can become crazy. But I'm playing thousands of games in my head, and uh, you're winning each time. And uh, not only you're winning each time, but because you have enough uh, time to find the better option. But then you turn the board, you're playing black, black, white, and then you turn the ball, board, and you're playing on the, for the other side. And now you're trying to improve the play of the other side. And then you're turning the ball again and again and again. And after a few days, in fact, there is no, you, in every game you're white or you're black and you do your best to win. But then at some moment, and it doesn't matter, you are white and then you'll be black and then you'll be white again. The important thing is that all the pieces are your partners or your, your tools for survival. And uh, the, for, 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 me, for victory over this uh, the, the, the evil which tries to destroy you. And that's how I feel about Israel uh, world jury. And uh, in, 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 uh, through my professional work, when, when uh, in uh, prison I had to feel myself connected to all the Jews of the world. And then the government, I had all the time to think how I am bringing the word of the government to Jewish people. And then on Jewish agency, how I'm bringing uh, uh, Jewish people's interests and pains to Israel government. And turning the board again and again, once I am Israeli, once I am Jew diaspora. And together, and somehow it doesn't matter because this feeling of togetherness, one family, that's what's important. And we can win only together. And the power of Jews of the world depends on Israel. Israel, uh, the best defense of Israel is world Jewry. And it's very important uh, to, all the time to, to feel yourself both. And that's uh, the image which we use in our book. Yeah. And we're, we're muscular moderates. We're not these kumbaya people saying, oh, just everybody has an opinion. What we're saying is you have strong opinions, you have strong principles, but, and this is a countercultural idea also in the university today, we can learn by seeing the other perspective. We can learn by saying, huh, how does it look from the left or from the right if we tend to be from the right or from the left? And that's the challenge. And that actually leads to a stronger, more resilient series of principles. Uh, thank you, Natan. We'll now turn to Gilad. Thank you both. Um, I'll begin with a very softball question because as you were speaking, I, I was curious. Natan, I, I know you're still in the game by still being involved in institutes against countering anti-Semitism. Are you still playing chess after all these years? Uh, yeah, well, the, thanks God to, uh, today uh, because of internet. At any moment when you have a few minutes, you can always find somebody more or less on your level uh, in any part of the world and to play. So sometimes I, I uh, I'm doing it. Uh, but frankly speaking, it's much less dramatic than games of the Punish Excel. Yeah, yeah. And I'm smart uh, enough not to play with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, kind of a basic question that, that relates to sort of the, the, the bottom line of the book. Why is the relationship between 
Israel and the diaspora, between Jews in Israel and Jews abroad, even important, right? What, what would we lose if that relationship falters and what do we all gain by, by strengthening that connection? Well, uh, Gil, you want to start? Because that's something that we deal a lot in our book. Sure, well, there are actually two dimensions to this question. One is why is it so important? And two, why is it so contentious? And we, we deal with both sides of that. So why is it so important? It goes back to the, the themes that you keep on hearing. Never Alone is about community and continuity and family. Who better than one another to look out for each other? The Israelis need the most effective, most aggressive allies uh, to fight against delegitimization. Who better than camera? Who better than students? Who better than diaspora Jews? And in the modern world where so many Jews are lost ideologically, are lost Judaically, are drifting, what better inspiration do we have? And we see this when camera comes with its delegation, we see it with 750,000 people who participated in birthright, when you come to Israel. So could we cut, one, cut off from one another? Yes. But would Israelis lose that sense of peoplehood? Also, by the way, the justification for the state, because it is a Jewish state. And would we lose also these amazing allies? Absolutely. And would American Jews and Canadian Jews and British Jews lose a source of inspiration, a source of anchoring, a source of history that helps explain who we are and this anomaly that's so confusing to our non-Jewish friends that we're both a, a nation and a religion? And that's expressed in Jerusalem, it's expressed at the Kotel, it's expressed in everything about Israel. So why give it up? But now why are there constant tensions? And this actually gets to one of the fun things about the book, that Natan and I both had been on the speaking circuit and had been writing for many, many years. And we should come up with our own little explanation. Natan talked about how both American Jews or diaspora Jews and Israeli Jews have, a, have different survival strategies. Israelis are living in a very tough neighborhood in the Middle East creating a democracy, but have to figure out as a majority culture, how do you survive in a very rough neighborhood? American Jews are living in, let's say, a, a kinder, softer, gentler neighborhood, but are saying, how do we as a minority survive surrounded by a majority? So inherently, there are certain differences. I, for a while, have been talking about how Israelis are more Davidian, more like King David, focused at the end of the day on survival against Goliath, survival against the Philistines, sovereignty. And you sometimes have to make very tough choices. American Jews are more Isaiah, focusing on their universal ideals of peace and justice and brotherhood and universalism. Now, of course, when you drill down into Isaiah, it's also about Jewish peoplehood. And when you drill down into David, he's also playing the harp. So we see that, yes, superficially there are differences, and that's where we clash, but underlying it are overlaps. The book is very new. Uh, the Queen's Gambit might not make an appearance, but the coronavirus does make an appearance. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, since some of its themes are, are timeless, could the same book have been written a decade or two ago? Or was it written now to urgently address some sort of new forces, some, some new fissures uh, among the Jewish people? and a, a new zeitgeist in the diaspora or in Israel or in the West? Well, look, I, uh, 30 years ago, almost immediately after going out of prison, I wrote book Fear No Evil, which in some way, in a in much more practical way, day-to-day, -day, uh, describes survival and uh, uh, resistance in the prison. Could this book be written then? Of course not, because I didn't have my experience in the government and I didn't have my experience uh, in the Jewish uh, 15 years ago, I wrote a book together with Ron Dermer, The Case for Democracy, where my being in the government and uh, experience with uh, Oslo Agreement uh, and uh, comparing it with my, our experience as this is the Soviet Union, brought me to feel that people in the West forget the real power of freedom. They live in freedom, they take it naturally, they don't. So uh, that, then also I could write the book which is based on my comparing my experience in the Soviet Union and the Israeli government, but 
this book, which mainly dialogue between Jewish people and Israel, uh, uh, could not be written. I think uh, uh, I decided to write this book just because, on one hand, uh, in, the, in the most difficult moments of the crisis, of the crisis of the Kotel on one hand, uh, when uh, world jury or a big part of world jury is uh, feeling that Israel gone and betrays them, and uh, crisis of Iran, when the uh, prime minister of Israel tells me, but these Jews really don't like Israel. They like Israel only their imagination, but not the one which has to fight for its right to exist. And so this moment of this big mutual distrust, which we describe, of course, in the book, that's the moment when I thought that the time has come to compare all these three experiences and to write the book about the dialogue uh, between Israel and Jewish people. And of course, I was lucky to, to propose to Gil, who has also experience as an activist, but also as a historian. One of the things that helped us in writing the book was at the very beginning, my son Yoni, who's 23, uh, read Fear No Evil. And he said, why didn't they just shoot him? And I realized that when Natan wrote Fear No Evil, everybody knew what the Soviet Union was. Everybody knew that communism was trying to convince the world that it was a force for good. And, and everybody knew sort of the rules that the Soviet Union government, that Soviet Union, the Soviet government played. This generation, your generation, fortunately, has grown up in a world where the Soviet Union collapsed and disappeared. And the only dictators you know are Nazis and Hollywood. And so that question helped us in a broader way also contextualize and explain some of the rules and the craziness of the Soviet Union to help in a way that wasn't necessary in Fear No Evil to bring people into the complexity of the Soviet experience. And it also, I think, uh, inspired us to continually think of the 18 year old, the 20 year old, the 22 year old student in university being bombarded with all kinds of negative messages. And we were hoping that this book would specifically speak to that generation, would specifically explain why be Jewish, why be proud, why not just defend Israel, but celebrate Israel and celebrate Zionism. Let me combine two questions that we have from the audience uh, on a related topic here. Uh, one question is from someone doing their undergraduate research now on the unique form of Soviet anti-Semitism and their attack on Jewish memory. And they ask, uh, I'm curious, how would you view the Soviet weaponization of memory and attack on Jewish memory as informing the anti-Semitism we see on college campuses today. And maybe Natan would, would feel that. And the second part that I'm, I'm combining here is, if you could give one piece of advice, per, perhaps uh, Gil would answer that, to an uh, incoming college student, an uh, incoming Jewish college student before they, uh, in the diaspora, before they get to campus, what would that be in a, on, on one foot? Yeah. Well, uh... About uh, anti Semitism in the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you can understand communism, it was like uh, ide official ideology, communist ideology, or Bolshevik ideology, or Marxist Leninist ideology, but it was like a face, uh, meaning that, well, it uh, gives a bad, bad name to face, but meaning that it was not a face, it was like a religion. And in this religion, everybody had to accept this dogma of class struggle and class dictatorship of the proletariat for the creating equal society for everybody. And uh, there should be no gods in this religion except Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, or later Brezhnev. Uh, and that's why strong identities, whether it is national identity or religious identity, they were enemies of the, uh, of the regime. And that's why the uh, regime was fighting against strong identities. Very quickly became clear that one of the strongest identities, or the one which is really global, and the, the, it is Jewish identity. And very quickly, the Soviet Union, which started from condemning anti-Semitism and continued officially to condemn anti-Semitism all these years, started fighting against Jewish identity. And that's why I grew already second generation of Soviet Jews in absolutely assimilated by force. Now, at the same time, what was good in Soviet Union uh, was that their anti-Semitism uh, didn't, uh, uh, there was no difference between their hatred to Jewish state 
and they hated to, to Jewish people. When uh, Israel was under attack as a Zionist agent, everybody knew that Jewish neighbors have a problem. When there was campaign against uh, 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 cosmo, Jewish cosmopolites, uh, and they were accused that uh, their real influence is coming from abroad. Everybody knew that that's, again, uh, aggressive position of the Soviet Union towards Israel. So nobody had any doubt that it is the same, that attack on Israel and attack on Jews uh, are, are simply uh, communist ideology fighting for being the only religion among Soviet people. Now, the power of erasing, of making the people to forget was unbelievable. I grew, I was born a few years after the Second World War. I grew among the places which were all the killing fields of Holocaust. Tens of thousands of people were killed practically in every place where I was during my childhood. I was playing a few miles from the place where 75,000 people were killed only a few years ago. And we grew knowing nothing about Holocaust. So after the crime of Nazis, there was the crime of Soviets to try to erase it. Why? Because they understood that that can be a very important part of uh, Jewish identity. And uh, so uh, there was a war. Co uh, communist Soviet Union defeated fascist Nazi uh, regime. Of course, there were victims who were killed. No word about Holocaust, no word about those people who killed around you. They, they are all killed only because of the uh, Jewish. So that, uh, so uh, anti-Semitism was like the only type of Jewish identity which survived. But only when we start feeling uh, our identity with the real, with the positive information, not only with, uh, uh, with desire to escape anti-Semitism, then you, are, you have real strength to fight. And what is really important when, uh, when I have to spend a lot of efforts today, to uh, what we all have, uh, trying to convince people that some forms of attacking Israel, some, some anti-Zionist extremism. That is type, uh, type of anti-Semitism, as you know, sometimes very difficult to convince Jews that there is deep connection. That's why I had to invent my 3D definition. That's why international definition of anti-Semitism is so important. And, uh, but I have to say, everybody who had experience in the Soviet Union, they understand, they understand immediately. They don't have to be, uh, to be convinced. And also they understand the danger of double things, that, that, that when there is anti-Semitism and they try us to forget or to be afraid to speak publicly about your Jewishness, that is the beginning of the end of freedom for everybody. And that's why for these people it is much easier to understand the danger of this phenomenon of double think and fear uh, of uh, being uh, proud Jews publicly onto, in today's campus culture. Can people imagine how heartbreaking it must have been for me to sit with my friend who was in the Gulag for nine years, who believed growing up in a dictatorship that anti-Semitism was the tool of the dictator and show him the latest crises uh, of anti-Semitism in democracy. As bad as that was, because unfortunately he'd been dealing with this for 20, 30 years, it was even harder for me as someone who loves the university. I would say, I would say look at me. Um, a, a case of arrested development. I got to the university and never left. I became a professor. And for me to share with my friend the information about this new generation of students who approach one another with a totalitarian heavy hand and bully one another into submission and to share with him a, a, a study from the, um, from the Cato Institute that 63% of Americans not just in university, 63% of Americans feel at one point or another during the course of a typical month that they have to hide their beliefs. Can you imagine how devastating that is as an American who believes in freedom, who's proud of democracy? And can you imagine how devastating that must be as a Soviet refugee, as someone who escaped that, to see it happening in the centers of freedom, in the universities, which are supposed to be the capitals of free thought? 
I don't like to be a hysteric, but this is a real crisis. I don't like to be pessimistic because Golda Meir said you can't be a Zionist and, an, uh, and a pessimist, and I'm a Zionist, so I'm an optimist. But this is something we really have to deal with. And I want to reach out to our students on the call. I want to reach out to our Jewish and non-Jewish participants on the call. And if you ask me to give one piece of advice, I would say be an anti-propagandist. Be a skeptic. Be part of that party of people who aren't fanatics, who have that ability to turn the chessboard around in their head. And you know, I'm a Zionist. I should be telling you, no, be an Israel advocate. It's more important for me that you be a skeptic than you be an advocate. It's more important for me that you be a free thinker and not a double thinker. It's more important for me that you be an individual thinker and not a group thinker. And the best way I can summarize it is with a purposely awkward term, because sometimes awkward terms stick in your head. Be an anti-propagandist. Say, I want to question my own side as well as the other side. I want to question the bullying culture. It's not just a cancel culture, it's a coercion culture. I want to be part of that party that goes back to John Stuart Mill and Betty Friedan and Martin Luther King and John Kennedy and Thomas Jefferson, all with their flaws that questions, that struggles, that anguishes. And if I'm allowed one last piece of advice, don't let the haters and the bullies define your existence. The best way to get out of it is to find communities through camera, through Hillel, through uh, I see we have Christian Zionists on the call through other like-minded people. Don't let them run your lives. Don't spend the whole time fighting against them. Also, celebrate your own ideals, your own culture, your own community. A related question. At the start of your book, you look at how the Soviet Union cultivated citizens with no individuality, whose voices merged into one because the government prohibited deviant expressions as you, as you described it. And the solution what you described as a solution was to live without fear and act independently. And I admit that as I was reading all of that in the, in the intro in the first chapter, my thoughts often drifted to modern day America where people feel increasingly worried about consequences for disagreeing with certain orthodoxies. But I also felt a little bit guilty comparing these two times and places because I didn't want to minimize, you know, sort of that, that, uh, Holocaust denial by comparing everything to the Holocaust. I didn't want to minimize the, the oppression faced by those behind the Iron Curtain um, living here in this free and outspoken America. So can a free country ever resemble the USSR? And to the extent that we do have a problem here, is it more difficult to address because we can't focus our fire on the obvious source on this government, this regime that kept the chains in place? Okay, uh, I always was... Uh... Uh, insisting that there is Chinese wall between the world of dictatorship and the free world. And whenever I was told that Russia is going back to where it was, I was saying, no, it cannot. Because, well, of course, it's very bad. Putin took it uh, many steps back, all the democracy in Russia, but there is no millions in Gulag and no millions working for KGB. So this fear doesn't control the mind of the people the way it's controlled. And that's all the difference. Even more so about free society. Uh, I propose criteria where they feel, live in fear society or free society, town square test. You can go up to town square and express your views and are not afraid of being punished by prison life, then you're in free, free society. If not, you're fear society. So it seemed very clear. In the last 15 years, it becomes more and more complicated because we see the phenomenon of double thinking in the United States of America that we're speaking about, which is typical of phenomena of the people living in fear under the cage. And, and uh, uh, we see this cancel culture, which uh, by definition, cancel culture it comes from the regimes which are trying to cancel, to prohibit uh, the big parts of cancel, uh, culture. So, so, but so it seems like there is some similarity. Where is the difference? The difference is that the totalitarian regime, it was the fear of KGB. And it is a massive force with the, with the army, with Gulag, with the prisons. Uh, so here it is fear of uh, public opinion, 
of being not popular among so, 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 uh, your your narrow professional circles. So what it means? It means that it is a decision which you make, not the system makes for you, but you make. And the moment you make this decision uh, to, to take care of your career and, and, and not to speak publicly on mind, you are giving away part of American democracy or American freedom. So or the world freedom or everybody's freedom. And so uh, the, the difference is that now it's up to every individual to decide whether you want to continue living in absolutely free society, or you're ready to make compromise with the, with your own freedom. Gil, you want to? Yeah, so, um, you know, this is, part of it is, we always emphasize that, yes, there's a huge difference between totalitarianism coming from the top down and coming from peers and professors. So, Lahav deal. But what's most important, and this is a historian, I'm, I'm very sensitive to false analogies. But the other thing is you have to learn from the past. And we should be studying the Soviet totalitarian system, which again, as I said earlier, it came from, from a really beautiful idea. It came from the beautiful idea of equality. So just as I said at the beginning, that much of what we see today comes from beautiful ideas of fighting racial injustice and wanting to be social justice warriors and, 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 and coming from something positive, but when done without breaks and done in a bullying fashion, becomes negative and toxic. And so we should use the example um, as warnings to, to be careful. And, and again, it's very easy to finger point. It's very easy to say, oh, what are they doing wrong? But let's also ask, what are we doing wrong? Are we listening to one another enough? Are we modeling the kind of behavior that we want to see in the university square, in the Jewish synagogue or the Jewish spaces? And the more we become tolerant, the more we learn from one another, the more we switch that chessboard around, and the more we build bridges, even with those who dare to disagree with us, the better off we are. And the other thing is, I think we have to pull out, we need like a, 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 a world a network of double thinkers. Um, all of us who are swallowing our pride and all of us who are allowing ourselves to be bullied have to stand up and say, I've kind enough. And then we'll see that it's a very small minority. I call it Twitter dumb, D-U-M-B. People think that life is about Twitter. It's not. Uh, we saw Joe Biden, you can love him or hate him, but he was elected by Main Street, not by Twitter. Twitter told us that it was going to be all the far left's leftists in the Democratic Party. There are many more mainstream people today. We call them the silenced majority. If you're a part of that, stop being silent. So Gil, is it even possible to maintain bipartisan support for Israel in this increasingly um, polarized atmosphere? Or is that polarization, as you suggested, not really reflecting the, the actual state of the country, but more the state of um, you know, social media? And as a historian, do you think there's anything we can learn from other divided eras in American history, which I assume they're, they're, you know, this isn't the first one that, that we've experienced? Absolutely. So first of all, for decades, it wasn't just that the bipartisan support for Israel was a gift to Israel. It was Israel's gift to the United States of America. A healthy democracy needs some issues on which left and right can agree. And just today, I think I saw that in the U.S. Congress, over 300 members of Congress, and it was 50% Democrats and 50% Republicans, signed a petition saying we don't want to uh, condition aid to Israel, we want unconditional support for the state of Israel. We make a mistake when we allow the tribes and, we, and, 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 and the AOCs and the marginal people to run the conversation and we think they represent a trend. We do the same thing in the Jewish community, by the way, right? What do we do? We take the three people in Jewish Voices of Peace, right? 50,000 people go on birthright two years ago. 12 people from Jewish Voices for Peace on purpose come and walk out. And everybody's talking about those 12, not the 49,988. Did I get my math right? I mean, it's insane. So we, we ourselves are addicted to the margins. We ourselves are addicted to the radicals. And yes, we, there are examples to learn. Look, there's a warning. We have the most powerful warning in American history about the Civil War. But what happened? We had a president who called out the better angels of our nature. We had a president who spoke about the mystic accords of memory that unite us. We had a president, Abraham Lincoln, who emphasized that which we commit to and that which unites us, not also the, that which divides us. And we don't just do it from the top down. We have to do it in our own conversations. We have to do it in our own interactions. And so, yes, there are many examples of, look, in the 1960s, everybody said, oh, America is a sick society. America's falling apart. 
And then you can love him or hate him, but Ronald Reagan came with a song of mourning in America. And Bill Clinton, I'll be bipartisan, talked about centrism. And, and, and so there have been presidents, there have been leaders who built up the center. And I call them mus muscular moderates because they also had strong opinions, but there also were those who played the divisions. It seems like the time has, oh, sorry, not time, please. I only want to add one thing, uh, we write about it also in our book, that in order uh, uh, support of Israel will be bipartisan. We have to fight our enemies bipartisan, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is such a uniting everybody thing. But if people on the left will fight anti-Semitism on the right and will deny importance of anti-Semitism on the left, and people on the right will fight on anti-Semitism on the left and will deny the importance of anti-Semitism on the right. And anti-Semitism, by the way, is rising from both sides uh, at the same time. If you will not be bipartisan, meaning uniting our efforts against both of these anti-Semitism, how we can expect from America not to be, bi to be bipartisan? That's my comment. I feel like people in the audience could could keep watching this for an hour, and and I know you know our time is limited. There there are a lot of great questions that have gone unanswered. I think I'm seeing some of them are answered in the book. So if you haven't already read Never Again, yeah. Never Alone, please I read the book, and then we'll talk again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there'll be more talks, and and um, there'll, there'll be more events with with Gil and Natan. And at the same time, Camera will be holding, uh, you know, continuing this lecture series. On May 6th, we have CAMERA's curriculum expert, Steve Statsky, giving a briefing on a topic of urgent importance, which is indoctrination in public schools. So I hope everyone can yeah. join us for that. And, um, you know, thank you both so much for taking the time to, to join us. And I look forward to uh, seeing everyone again.